Hello and welcome to Stories from India, a podcast where we talk about myths, legends and folk tales from India. I am your host Narad Muni and I am a mythological character myself. I have the gift of eternal life and knowledge of the past, the present and the future. By profession, I am a travelling musician and a storyteller. So the way I am doing my job is by podcast. In this episode, we are talking about the king of heaven. And that is not Indra. It may surprise you to know this, but Indra was not always the ruler of heaven. There was a time when it was ruled by Nahush. This is Nahush's origin story. It starts with a prophecy. The person who originated the prophecy is me. That should not be a surprise. As I've said countless times on the show, I know everything there is to know, including the past, the present and the future. So there I was one day, walking in a garden, when I met Shiva and Parvati. They were there on a picnic and cordially invited me to join them. and because i accepted what follows is an eyewitness account we were chatting about this and that and then when it was time to eat parvati opened the picnic basket her expression suddenly changed i can't believe i forgot to bring spoons again she said but shiva was not in the least bit disturbed We've got nothing to worry about, see? he asked, waving spoons in his hands. Where did the spoons come from? Parvati asked, surprised. Your hands were empty a second ago. I just waved my wand and created them, Shiva explained, but with a smile. Parvati wasn't buying it. No, you cannot fool me. If Brahma had said that I could have believed it but you you're a destroyer you're right I'll come clean Shiva relented it's not me it's the tree oh kalpariksha parvati exclaimed in delight i have always wanted one which version is this this is version 2.4 It's not the latest but perfectly capable of creating anything material Shiva said So how does this work Parvati asked Do I need a catalog and feed in an SKU number or scan a barcode somewhere Before Shiva could reply a thick product catalog dropped in her lap along with a barcode scanner That's the more complicated way, Shiva said. Usually I just think of something and it appears. Like this. And just like that, a big red and juicy apple fell into his outstretched hands. We spent the next few hours testing the power of the tree. Kalpariksha is able to create fruits. I think it should also be able to create a regular human looking baby Parvati said and just as she finished that sentence in her arms appeared a newborn baby girl Parvati was delighted both her other children Ganpati and Kartikeya were boys and she had longed for a girl for a long time they decided to call her Ashok Sundari That's when I came up with the prophecy She's going to marry the king of heaven I said Not Indra Parvati gasped She can't marry Indra Yeah Indra has a bit of a reputation if you know what I mean Not unlike his Greek equivalent Zeus But I had to correct her That's not what I said. I corrected her. I said 
she'll marry the king of swarg or heaven a casual observer hearing this would likely have bet heavily that a change of leadership in swarg was imminent but we'll come back to that ashok sundari grew up to be a brave intelligent girl when your daddy can destroy the whole universe and your mommy is par itself it's highly likely that you will grow up to be fearless yourself one day ashok sundari and her friends were picnicking in the same garden that she was born in sometimes there are picnics that turn out great they're filled with surprises like in shiva and parvati's case but sometimes picnics can be ruined by inclement weather or worse if you have the worst kind of uninvited guest and the worst kind of uninvited guest is exactly what hunda was hunda was an evil asur he dropped in and generally started disrupting the picnic swiping their sandwiches kicking dirt over the picnic blanket that sort of thing get out of here right now screamed ashok sundari but hunda failed to notice the dangerous tone in her voice to him this was a challenge which he accepted he reached out to grab her but ashok sundari was too quick for him she twisted his arm and hunda did his best not to scream in pain as ashok sundari's friends advanced on the asur he decided that 5 to 1 were not fair odds and that he was pretty much overpowered already he had quite the ego though so he said uh five of you against me they're not fair odds i'm going to wait for you to get reinforcements get more people if you want to fight fair he said this with gritted teeth to hide the pain he was feeling in his arms ashok sundari laughed and let hunda go at which point he exited the scene stage left claiming to be late for an appointment ashok sundari's friends warned her that this asur was the worst sort and that he would be planning revenge sure enough ashok sundari found out first hand within a week she went to what she thought was a secret birthday party for her friend instead it was an elaborate plan by hunda to abduct the girl and force her to marry him ashok sundari casually entered the house at the address on the birthday in white the moment she did all the doors and windows of the house shut and she realized that she was the only one there well strictly speaking not the only one there was hunda grinning an evil grin what are you going to do now he asked scream for mummy and daddy i had this house specially constructed no one on the outside can hear anything even gods perfect said ashok sundari it took a full minute for hunda to realize that she had not said that word sarcastically there had been real menace in her tone and that caught him completely by surprise you mean to say you're really very frightened aren't you he asked nervously she advanced on him with a menacing grin on her face hunda gulped once or twice it wasn't much of a fight A few minutes later standing over the badly bruised asur Ashok Sundari warned him I could finish you off you know but I really won't I don't want to get my hands dirty I'll leave that task for my husband You're married 
I seriously didn't know that. The Asur begged. Quiet, you. I'm not married. I'm talking about my future husband. The future son of the future king, Ayu. The Asur still couldn't believe what he was hearing. You're going to marry Ayu's son? He doesn't have a son. In fact, he's just in elementary school. Are you seriously going to wait that long? Why not? countered Ashok Sundari. I'm a goddess. I'm not going to age. The Asur got to thinking. So, Ayu's son was going to kill him, was he? Not if he killed Ayu's son first. Ashok Sundari was meanwhile bidding him farewell. And next time you want to ask a lady out, don't try to abduct her. Get her flowers, chocolate, and seriously, try anything except abduction. I don't think Hunda got the message, because from that very day onwards, he began to work on a plan to abduct Ayu's baby. He had cooked up the perfect plan, but he had to wait for several years before he could put it in action. You see, Ayu had to grow up first. Ashok Sundari's curse meant that he would not be killed until after Ayu had a baby. Knowing that his survival was guaranteed until then, this would have been the perfect time for Hunda to try dangerous things like skydiving and bungee jumping. But I guess Hunda was just the glass half empty kind of person. He must have not been very smart either. Otherwise, his target would have been Ayu. Eliminating Ayu would have guaranteed that his future assassin would not be born. After several years of school, Ayu finally went through the other phases of life for a king, including his coronation and some politically motivated marriages. Through one such marriage, Ayu and his queen had a baby boy. They called the boy Nahush. The very night that Nahush was born, Hunda put his evil master plan in action. It began easy, but then got complicated. It started off with Hunda jumping in through the balcony, picking up the sleeping infant and flying off again. As he was flying back home, if Hunda had done one of a dozen things, even if he accidentally lost his grip on the baby, the story would have been very different. But he did not do that. Instead, he went home and asked his cook to prepare dinner. With Nahush. And just to be clear, I don't mean that the baby would help the cook make dinner. I meant Nahush was the main course. The cook was used to some outlandish requests from his employer. I mean, just yesterday, Hunda had eaten jalebis with salt and pepper. But this was a new low, even for him. The cook just could not bring himself to follow instructions. Luckily for him, he had heard a few episodes on the show where babies were substituted with something else. So, he did the same. He cooked a really tasty vegetable meal. Knowing that Hunda had never eaten vegetables or babies before, the Asur would not be able to tell the difference. There was no guarantee of the cook's own safety if he kept the baby. So he decided that the best thing to do would be to leave the baby at the doorstep of a powerful rishi. And that's another thing that has happened a couple of times on the show, which really goes to show that the cook was a big fan of this podcast. And he could not have chosen a better rishi. He picked Vashisht, 
Vashisht was a Maharishi and the more sensible of the two battling rishis back in episode 15. The cook did not leave an accompanying letter to explain the circumstances. But when you're a super powerful and knowledgeable rishi like Vashisht, an explanation is usually not necessary. The next morning, there were two diametrically opposite emotions. In Ayu's palace, the king and queen were distraught at finding their baby missing. Vashisht was glad to give the baby shelter. He also realized that returning the baby to the king and queen was not a good idea because Hunda would just try again. This was better. Let the baby grow up here with Vashisht. The only thing remaining was to reassure Nahush's parents. He needed an extremely reliable messenger, one who could be trusted with a secret of this magnitude. And that's where I come in. That's part of my job description. I was happy to reassure Nahush's parents. Their baby was growing up with a powerful rishi in a secret place. He would be totally fine. And yes, by he, I meant the baby. Though Vashisht would be totally fine as well. And when Nahush was all grown up, he would take on Hunda. Several years passed until finally, Vashisht thought Nahush had grown into a brave and wise young man. He decided it was time for him to fulfill the terms of his prophecy. When Nahush learned his history and his destiny, he was filled with rage. Mixed in with all that rage was a little discomfort. He was expected to marry Ashok Sundari, who by all accounts was a hundred years older than him. He wasn't on board with that part of the plan. Nahush walked to the palace where Hunda lived. It seemed that Hunda had kept a low profile these days. And the palace seemed to be an advanced state of disrepair. It was almost deserted. But after looking carefully, he did see some sign of activity. After searching several rooms, Nahush finally found the Asur. Hunda was in an upstairs bedroom. He was not sleeping. Nahush walked in boldly and declared that this was Hunda's day of reckoning. Finally, what took you so long? asked Hunda. But the voice was weak and when Nahush turned on the lights and stepped in, he could see the setup. Hunda was lying down in bed and it seemed like he had been in that bed for years. He had all kinds of tubes and systems that seemed to keep him hanging on. Your Hunda? asked Nahush. We are getting towards the end of the episode. Aren't we going to have a major showdown? That's what the listeners would have wanted. Hunda explained that he wished things were different, but he had led a difficult life. First, he was beaten up very badly by Ashok Sundari. Keep that in mind when you are marrying her, he advised Nahush. If you want to avoid what happened to me, never ever annoy her in any way. But Ashok Sundari didn't do this to you, retorted Nahush. You were quite healthy when you abducted me. She started it, the Asur replied. But you're right to some degree. I was reasonably okay. It's just that the night that I abducted you, I got the worst case of vegetable poisoning. My cook probably didn't realize it, but healthy vegetables are toxic to an Asur. My body weakened. I should not have survived for as long as I did. But I did survive 
because of Ashok Sundari's curse. Only you can release me from this painful existence. Please, please end this for me. I beg you. I don't think I will, Hunda, Nahush replied. You have been a whole different level of evil than what I've ever seen. You need to be punished. And if punishing you means continuing this existence, so be it. I will never ever show you mercy. If the curse prevents anybody else from releasing you, that's your problem. I will never let you escape that punishment. He turned and began walking out of the room. And that's when he tripped on the power cord. With Hunda's support system disconnected, the end was quick for him. Oh well, thought Nahush, you can't win at everything. And he walked out of there. Now that he had fulfilled the prophecy by ending Hunda's life, Ashok Sundari was waiting for him outside the palace. Nahush saw her and immediately realized who she was. He shyly shuffled his feet and explained, that he knew she looked about his age and that it was their destiny and all that. But honestly, maybe the hundred-year age gap was a little bit much, you know? At least that's how the conversation began. Until Ashok Sundari pointed out that she had spent most of her life traveling in parts of the universe with her parents. And all the travel was close to the speed of light. That meant, taking time dilation into effect, she wasn't really that much older than Nahush. Okay, that works for me, let's do it. He agreed quickly. Nahush returned to his parents' kingdom. He was crowned the next king, and he married Ashok Sundari. The couple had a son called Yayati. Yayati is the ancestor of most of the main characters in the Mahabharata. So you can think about today's story as a kind of a prequel to the main storyline of the Mahabharata. That's all for this week. A couple of notes. We've encountered Indra and Kalpariksha before. There are links in the show notes to those episodes. Nahush does become the king of Swarg but I'll keep that story for a future episode. Nahush would also meet Yudhishthir and Bhim, two of the Panda brothers from the Mahabharata, but that's for another episode as well. There are many things in today's story that may remind you of Sleeping Beauty. There's the idea of a curse, there's an idea of an evil entity, a witch or an asur, who was destined to be killed by the protagonist. Nahush grew up in anonymity, similar to Princess Aurora as well. And the hundred-year age gap between Nahush and Ashok Sundari is mirrored in the Sleeping Beauty story as well. That's all for now. In the next episode, we'll go back to Tenali Raman. It's been a while since we did a story on the miserly and yet clever Chester so we'll be doing his stories next week. If you have comments or suggestions, or if there are particular stories that you would like to hear, please do let me know by leaving a comment or a review on the site, sfipodcast.com, or tweet at sfipodcast. You can also find me on Instagram and Facebook. Be sure to subscribe to the show to get notified automatically of new episodes. A big thank you to each one of you for your continued support and your feedback. The music is from purpleplanet.com. That's purple-planet.com. I'll see you next time.